Well, good morning, everyone. Is everybody able to warm up? I know it's a little chilly out there, but they tell me the temperature is going up. Uh, but we have a great show for you. Uh, it's really shaping up. Uh, I wouldn't look in one of the doors to the halls right now because we're going to open tomorrow morning, and right now it's a little scary in there. But somehow, some way, they pull it off, and they have a gorgeous floor ready for you at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, I, first, I'd like to thank you for being here. Quite, that's that's the uh, the most important thing for us at HAI is the member support and the industry support overall for events such as Heli Expo, but even more specific for our safety symposiums. Uh, as you know, HAI's priority is safety first above everything else. And we, we actually practice that in everything we do at the association and certainly with our members. Uh, this morning is going to be a fantastic topic line, uh, how to analyze an accident, what's involved with that, what's the progression of what happens when you do have an unfortunate event such as that. And you're going to have some really great subject matter experts here to explain all of the elements that go into an accident and how it affects the operators and uh, the people in the industry and those that were on the aircraft, of course. Uh, I'd just like to impart a little thought which I've been uh, working with for a couple of years now. Uh, you're going to do an analytical deep dive into a lot of data, facts, details. And I'd like you somewhere along there to back out just a little and look at the personal side of an accident. We certainly want to take all the information we get, the facts they find, what caused the accident, how do we learn from it, how do we prevent it from ever happening again. But I want to back up before the accident happened. I want to get a cultural change and a philosophy that's in place and we change the way we do business and we look at safety first above everything else and prevent the accident to begin with. Uh, but when it happens, uh, one thing I think we kind of overlook is the personal impact on the human beings involved in that accident. And certainly on the victims who might perish in the accident, get injured, and their families. And I don't think people really do that. You read an NTSB report and you see names, you see uh, three passengers, two crew, what the fatalities were, the analytical aspect of it. And I want you to think while you're doing this course about the human factor side and the effect it has. And what I mean by that is one person gets killed in an accident, that has the potential to affect 95 to 100 people within his immediate family or her immediate family, within their work environment, within their uh, friends. It's not just the person, it's all the lives that have been changed by that event. Um, I had an opportunity and I still maintain the contacts with people who have lost someone in an accident and those who have survived accidents. And I met a mother uh, who had just lost her 19-year-old son in a helicopter accident. Uh, I looked in that, that mother's eyes and immediately had no problem realizing her life had just changed forever and it'll never be the same for the rest of her life. And, and the agony she experienced was multiplied through the family, through the friends, and uh, through the work associates. And it was interesting because as I'm talking to her, I realize what this really means when we're making decisions on whether we go, no go, whether we leave that aircraft in service or take it out, and our, our risk assessment and our decision making. And when we do it wrong, this is what you're looking at, ruin lives, not just the victims. Uh, but of course, that's tragic in itself. But how far it extended really kind of grabbed me because after I spent an hour with her, and it changed the way I look at the industry, it changed the way that I would fly, I would make decisions, and someone walked up to me and said, do you know the whole story? And I said, I think I do. She was very open, and I'm appreciative of that, and it's really changed the way I look at the world. Did she tell you about her husband? And I said, no, she never mentioned her husband. Her husband was so distraught at the loss of his son that a few months after the accident, he committed suicide. That's how bad it affects people. And I'm really concerned that we lose sight of that, that we look at the mechanics, the nuts and bolts, the details, and that's all necessary to make us better and safer. But think about the human factors aspect and the effect it has on the people. And I will guarantee you, we did a seminar with a couple of pilots 
and we had someone who had that experience and they came and told it what it meant to them that they lost a family member. And we went in deep dive and drilled and this is what happens. And these are mothers, their fathers, their sons, their daughters, husbands, wives that we're talking about, not just statistics. And it's made a difference and a number of those pilots came back and they said, I'm never making decisions again the same way I used to. I get it. And, and that's something we, what we ought to think about and develop that cultural change and that, uh, that kind of realization of how we're really affecting people, not just collecting you know, the medal after the fact and going through litigation and insurance claims. Let's stop and think about the people involved in this. And I'm really glad you're here because you're kind of like the disciples to spread this message and help us uh, get safety out there into the helicopter community. And uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative that you're spending the time here on the day before the show uh, to talk on such a, on a really important topic. And, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Tarek, and uh, I really wish you well, and uh, we're going to have a great show for you. And uh, again, really, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Matt. We appreciate it. I'm going to thank you all for being here this morning. I know it's uh, bright and early on a uh, Monday morning. Any big winners last night? <laughs> no? <laughs> We're still here. The rest of you make donations to the casino of your choice, as I did? <laughs> all right. Thank you. Before we start, I want to recognize the efforts from the uh, HAI Safety Committee. Would you guys please stand? Also, any of the members from the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team or the IHST, I realize you spend an uh, absorbent amount of time from your uh, families, from your jobs, to uh, help better safety within the industry, and I, uh, I can't thank you enough for all of your efforts. Will you please give them a round of applause? <clears throat> thank you. I'm joined today by senior members of the uh, NTSB FAA and legal representation from the industry to talk about some of the challenges helicopter operators face after a serious or a fatal accident. As an operator, I hope it's a call you've never received. For myself, I've been in the aviation industry for about 30 years now. Unfortunately, I've received that call more than once. It never gets any easier. Lots of things race through my mind. Is anyone hurt? You know, what's going to happen to uh, me, my company, and most importantly, uh, what can I do to help? Um, I hope this presentation uh, with the panelists and an open and frank discussion will help answer some of these questions for you. And please, at the end, I, uh, we're going to leave some time for questions and answers at the end. I want to make sure that you guys participate as well. Before we get started, I'd like to offer you one bit of advice. You can never be too prepared. Make sure you have an emergency response plan that's alive and well in your organizations. Make sure you're drilling them normally, and as the uh, growing needs of your business change, make sure you're keeping up with it as well. It's, uh, it'll help you uh, much easier along when you're going through the process uh, if you have all those questions answered. And the last bit of advice is uh, get to understand the uh, NTSB's uh, process, understand how they, uh, you and your company will be involved in the party system. It'll be, uh, it'll be useful for you as we move along. We'll start with a presentation from each of our panelists, followed by questions and answers. <clears throat> our first panelist is the Deputy Director of Regional Operations for the NTSB's Office of Aviation Safety. He's charged with managing the NTSB's 50 field investigators and their supervisors who are responsible for leading the investigations for the majority of general aviation accidents, including helicopters. During his 14-year tender at the NTSB, excuse me, he has held various investigation positions, including senior air safety investigator in the central region and senior aviation accident investigation in the major investigation division in Washington, D.C. As an investigator in charge, he has led over 300 general aviation accidents across the country. In addition, he represents the United States and airline accidents around the world, including Afghanistan, Russia, Japan, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates. 
Please join me in welcoming Tim LeBaron. Well, good morning. Uh, thanks for getting up early to come here. Uh, hopefully it's not going to be too dry and boring of a presentation, but I think it's something that uh, when you leave here, I hope that you've learned something that's going to help you understand our process a little bit better. And unfortunately, I can't do a three-hour presentation today. I'm down to 20 minutes. So uh, toward the end, make sure you write your questions down and uh, feel free to ask us at the, the very end. So what is the NTSB? So the National Transportation Safety Board is an independent federal agency. So do you know what independence means? We're not under the Department of Transportation like the FAA. We're directly under Congress. We're totally separate. We're independent. We're charged by Congress with investigating every civil aviation accident in the United States. So that differs. Although we do five modes of transportation, aviation is the only mode that we're charged to investigate every accident. The other modes, uh, generally let's talk about highway. They don't go out and investigate every car crash, but if people are paying to be on that Greyhound bus and people die, you'll see someone from the NTSB there. So why do we even exist? It comes down to one thing, to improve transportation safety. That's it. That's it, we're a safety organization. And our goal for every single investigation we do is we're trying to prevent it from happening again. So it's a simple mission, it's not always easy. So the Office of Aviation Safety, we have 129 staff roughly. We're a little low right now, but that's our number, 129. So of that, we have 50 field investigators or IICs, and hopefully you know that IIC stands for investigator in charge. We have five major investigators, 53 specialist investigators, and the remainders are all management and support staff. So I threw a little chart in here um, just to show you kind of how we're structured. So our uh, director is John Delisi, and he's here. John, if you'd stand up or wave or something. John is the director of the Office of Aviation Safety. And then we kind of split. There's two deputies under John. So I'm one of them. And uh, so I pretty much have uh, the majority of the IICs, and those are the field investigators spread out throughout the United States. So we do have offices in Ashburn, Virginia, Denver, Colorado, Seattle, Washington, and Anchorage, Alaska. Dana Schultz, our other deputy director, uh, she has four of the major IICs under her, and then all those other specialist investigators are under Dana. So I know that you all probably can memorize this or have memorized it, but I think it's important. What is an accident? If you haven't been to Art 830, Part 830.2, it's a good place to go and review that. <clears throat> but it's an occurrence associated with the operation of an aircraft, which takes place between the time any person boards the aircraft with the intention of flight until such time as all such persons have disembarked in which serious injury or substantial damage occurs. And so the one part that I like to point out in that initially is the part of intention for flight. All right, so if you have someone going out, a maintenance person doing a ground run, balancing rotor blades, something happens, remember there's no intention of flight, it's not an accident. So of course, serious injury and substantial damage also have definitions, serious injury, Hospitalization more than 48 hours, broken bones other th than finger, nose, and toes, lacerations, injury to internal organs, second, third degree burns, or death within 30 days. Substantial damage, damage or failure which adversely affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of the aircraft, and which would normally require major repair or place it, replacement of the affected component. So what is not substantial damage? Engine failure if only one engine fails, bent fairings, cowlings, dented skin, small puncture holes in the skin or fabric, ground damage to rotor, propeller blades, damage to landing gear, wheels, tires, flaps, engine accessory, brakes, or wingtips. So I understand this is a general aviation description. Um, not all that pertains to helicopters. All right, so an incident is anything else. So I wanted to really quickly run through the types of investigations the NTSB does, 
And the abbreviations over in the far right, you don't have to pay attention to those. Those are our internal uh, way that we document what type of investigation we, we do. But the first three, the incident, data collection, limited investigations, you really could call those our desk investigations. In those, you're probably not gonna see an NTSB investigator. You probably will see an FAA inspector that's working with us to help gather information. But a good example, and I'll briefly just give you a little scenario for each one of those. Let's start with a data collection investigation. So you have a pilot flying along in a helicopter and the engine quits. They do an auto rotation, and unfortunately, the helicopter is substantially damaged. But in talking to the pilot, they say, you know what, I just ran out of gas. Nothing was wrong with the helicopter, it worked fine, I just ran out of gas. So in that scenario, instead of us spending a lot of time doing an investigation, remember, we have to investigate every civil aviation accident. So in that case, we'll do what we call a data collection report. It's very brief, it's very, very small, no safety payback. So let's take the same scenario. We get substantial damage, flying along, auto rotate down, substantial damage, but the pilot says, you know what, I have no clue why that engine quit. This is gonna require more investigation for us. It may end up having some safety payback. That's when we do the limited investigation. So let's take the same scenario one more time, and let's say that during the auto rotation, the pilot successfully lands. There is no substantial damage, there is no injury, but we happen to know that, you know what, there's been quite a few of this particular helicopter and engine combination that's lost an engine we may choose to investigate that as an incident. But we do have one main goal in mind. We're not gonna investigate it unless we believe there's gonna be some sort of safety payback for taking the time to investigate it. All right, so hopefully that makes sense to you, the three desk investigations. I'm gonna spend the majority of my time, the remaining time, on the next two, field investigations, field major investigations. That last one, foreign investigations, <clears throat> we do those as well often. And I'm not gonna spend any time on that, but I'll be around all day today, all day tomorrow in the question and answer session. If you have questions about those, I'd be glad to talk to you about, about them. All right, can your organization participate in an investigation? And the answer is maybe, maybe you can. So going to uh, part 831, it says, except for the FAA, no entity has the right to participate in an NTSB investigation as a party. So who decides if you can participate or not? That's the IIC. The IIC may designate one or more entities to serve as parties to an investigation. So that's the regs. Read the last sentence there. However, if you meet the qualifications, the answer generally is yes, you can participate. I put that word normally in there. I almost didn't. I was gonna say yes, you can, but I'm sure there's always a caveat but it comes down to most likely you're going to be allowed to participate. So what are the qualifications? It's persons, government agencies, companies, and associations whose employees functions and activities or products were involved in the accident or incident and that can provide suitable qualified technical personnel to actively assist in the investigation. And notice the suitable qualified technical is underlined um, oftentimes people come to the accident and maybe they happen to be the, the fellow running the parts crib, but he was the only one available to assist. Well, if they don't have some sort of technical expertise, unfortunately, they're not gonna be able to participate. Typical parties include the FAA, of course, by law, the operator, airframe manufacturer, and engine manufacturer. This list can go on and on and on. But for this crowd, primarily, this is who you're gonna see as party members to our investigations. So who isn't allowed? News media, of course, company media relations, and I don't know about your agency or organization, but it seems like that's getting more and more prevalent. You know, we get the tweeters, we get people involved, they wanna take pictures, they wanna send stuff out. Those people aren't allowed as part of our investigation. Individuals occupying legal positions and insurance personnel are not invited. So who should you send that unfortunately, if you have a fatal accident. So I've got two actual titles here, party coordinator, which is the operator spokesman, and party specialist, 
and that's the employee or employees with technical expertise. Primarily, a party coordinator is needed if you're going to have a, a very, very large uh, investigation. Perhaps you have a GO team coming from Washington, and I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. So let's talk about party coordinator and specialist. They must be a full-time employee of the operator. So you can't hire a consultant to participate in the investigation. It's a question we get a lot of time. Can we hire somebody to participate? And the answer is no. Have to be a full-time employee. And a specialist, again, you have to have that needed experience or an expertise that we need. All right, so this is a typical on-scene organizational chart for what you're probably going to see if you're involved in an accident. You got that IIC from the NTSB, that's generally going to be one person. That's it. And then your party members, FAA, operator, airframe manufacturer, engine manufacturer. So in this case, that party coordinator uh, may be all you have. You may just have one person participating. So who would I think would be a good person? Let's say you have uh, your uh, safety, uh, your lead safety guy at your organization, they're probably a pretty good person to have there if you can only have one person. They understand our process. They have a direct line back to upper management. They have direct line down to staff. That'd be a good person. So I did throw in a chart here to show you that this can get a lot more uh, busy. So let's say that uh, on a particular accident, we have uh, one of our helicopter specialists from the NTSB that's going to go out and help. And so, since I mentioned that, we do have Cheech here. So Cheech, you can stand. You all probably know Cheech. So that's his specialty. He's a, is an investigator that knows helicopters. And so what we may do with Cheech is we may put him in as a group chairman. Okay, so he's going to be looking perhaps at the structural components or whatever the helicopter. And we may, on a particular investigation, have need, maybe we suspect maybe there's some engine problems. So we may have one of our, our turbine engine specialists come from Washington, D.C. And so he's going to form another group, and all they're going to do is look at the power plant. And then maybe, for some reason, we have a lot of eyewitnesses. So we called an investigator in from the NTSB and say, all we want you to do is focus on doing interviews of witnesses. And then maybe we have some structural failure, and so we want to bring in one of our top investigators that knows structures very well. We can build as many groups as we want to, okay? So if we do that, you can put someone on each and every one of those groups as long as they're technically qualified. And that's what happens with a lot of organizations. They don't have the depth to actually put somebody in every group. But you can't. So I threw this in there that it actually can get a little bit bigger than just one person from your organization. Party form. So every person that participates has to fill out a party form or sign it. In the past, we used to say one person from the organization, and now we want every person to sign it. And so why are they signing? What is this all about? It makes sure that they know the rules and how our investigations work. And it makes sure that uh, the big thing is that they're not talking to everybody about what they've, they've learned in the investigation. So the next slide here talks about just that. So, you know, you can, if you get party status, you can get expelled or kicked off. And the easiest and the best way to get kicked off an investigation is to go to a press conference and tell the world that your pilots did everything right and, and that the airplane was an annual and there was nothing wrong with the airplane. So if you want to go out and do a press conference without the NTSB knowing, um, that's a good way. By the next morning, you'll no longer be part of the investigation. So, so don't go talk to the press. Don't go talk to, start uh, sending pictures, putting pictures on Instagram and Facebook. If that happens, uh, you'll be disinvited from being part of the investigation. But the last paragraph here really boils down to, we know that whoever is sent to that investigation has a boss back at home. And I don't know about you all, but I expect our investigators every night to report in to let us know, what did you find out? So we understand that. So the point is, it's on a need to know basis. Those people that go on scene, they're not gonna be talking to all of their friends telling everything that they found out. But we understand they're gonna be talking to their supervisors as well. 
So that's okay. Field notes, very, very, very important. So here's the thing, don't send someone to the investigation that in two days they have to leave and go to a wedding. Or they have an appointment they can't meet, or they can't miss. So once you're there to the investigation, you're there for the whole investigation. You can't leave. So you can't substitute somebody halfway through where you sent someone, they need to leave. We understand if there's some family emergency, but they need to be there for the whole investigation. And until these field notes are done and signed and reviewed by the IIC, they're not allowed to leave. Okay? So it depends. Uh, investigations may be two, three days on scene. Maybe they're a week. I'm not sure. Every investigation is different. The other thing that they're required to do at the very end is to sign them. So we want everybody that was part of that particular investigation to sign off, yes, we agree on these factual things. I'm not saying those things will never, ever change. Maybe in a follow-up investigation, uh, on a component, maybe something will change. But these are generally what everybody agrees. Yes, this is what we did. Everybody signs. If you disagree or your person disagree, just have them write in here, I disagree with this, and that's fine, initial it. But they've got to sign field notes. So after the investigation, you went back home, what happens? Well, parties in good standing are invited to our follow-up test, interviews, and the technical review. And I want to talk about the technical review. It's very, very important, and I think a lot of people just gloss over the technical review. But basically, any type of uh, testing we do afterwards, your party person is invited to go along with us, participate. So let's talk about technical review. So there's two main things that a technical review is for. And I wish I could pound this point down to you. Technical reviews are important. As a party member, you're going to get a copy of all of those factual reports. Maybe it's just one factual report. Maybe it's different group chairman reports. You're going to get a link to go in and look and see all of our factual information, our docket. And I see what happens is people don't take the time to review that. And after the technical review, they have a problem and they bring it up. So what you're doing here is you're going through and making sure that, yes, this is factual information. And if it's not, you have a chance to speak up, and usually it's one of two ways. On some of our investigation, this is all going to be done via email. On some of our bigger investigations, you're actually going to be invited to sit in a room with us and talk about it. But if you see something that factually isn't correct, bring it to the attention. Let's get it right, because... The analysis portion is all based on facts. So if the facts are wrong, we need to know about it. The second part of a technical review is to see, is there more investigative work that we need to do? Is there another exam that you feel like that, you know what, you really should have done that and you didn't. This is a time to bring it up. Okay, and the last line there is, this isn't a time for analysis. We're not talking about analysis at this point. We're just trying to get the facts down. So when an investigator sends you a report to review, take it serious. Look at it, comment. If you send your comments in and you don't get a reply back from the investigator, I want to know about it, because that's unacceptable. All right, so technical reviews are very, very important. Submissions and final report. Parties do not participate in the analysis section. You get to make sure we have all the facts right. All right, but here's something you can do that you may not know about. If you're a party member, you can provide a submission to the report. What is a submission? A submission is your own findings, your recommendation. You can even put a probable cause. We think this is a probable cause. So the last sentence there, just so you know, is understand that what of your submission is, it will go in our public docket so the world can see it. All right, so we encourage submissions. So who determines the probable cause? And the answer is, it's those five presidential appointees, when we have all five, right now we're down, but they're the ones that determine the probable cause or their designee. Their designee in the Office of Aviation Safety is John DeLisi. Okay, so if this goes to a board meeting or it's a bigger one that goes all the way to the board, they will determine the probable cause. For some of the others, John is the one. But one thing I want you to know, it's not the IIC. The IC is gathering the facts. 
the IIC can propose, excuse me, propose a probable cause, but they're not the one that determines the probable cause. All right, so I wanted to bring this up. Do you see where the IIC sits in this for lines of authority for conflict resolution? They're not at the top. And I know this has been problems in the past where party members, they get upset, they don't think the IIC is doing something right. Well, above the IIC, you got a chief. Talk to the chief about it. If that doesn't work, you're still not happy, come talk to me about it. If we don't get resolution, let's go to John Delisi and talk about it. And you know what? The list goes above John. It goes all the way. It ends at the board. It probably above the chairman goes to the president if you have an end with the president. But, um, so I just want you to know the IC isn't the end all. If you're having problems with an IC and you feel like they're not getting it, they're not doing, hey, go to their chief. Go up the line. Let's see what we can figure out. NTSB contact information, I want to throw this up there. Um, that response operations center phone number, and you might take a picture of the slide up there, or if you forget, just remember ntsb.gov, it's on our first page. But the response operations center, so let's, let's, let's talk about this. If we have a major accident, or you have an accident, you need to know, like, I gotta let the NTSB know, just call this number, they've got everybody's phone number, notify the comm center. But here's other things that they're good for. Let's say that um, you've already notified the NTSB, um, and you need to know uh, where is the investigative team going to meet at. Call the comm center and say, where's, where are the investigators meeting at? Maybe you want to know what hotel the investigators are meeting at. Call the comm center and say, hey, I need to know what, what uh, hotel people are staying at. Use that number. as part, You're part of the team at this point. Use that number to find out information. That same number, you can get hold of me. Same number, you can get hold of John. Get hold of all of us. So that's an important number. And again, if you forget, just go to ntsb.gov. Also, ntsb.gov, I didn't go over 6120.1 uh, accident forms. That's also up on that website. And then there's my contact information. All right, 22 minutes long. So with that, uh, we'll turn it back over. Thank you, Tim. Good job. Our next panelist is the director of the FAA's Accident Investigation Division, a position he has held for the past four years. His prior experience includes 18 years with the NTSB's Office of Aviation Safety, which he served as a field investigator, aerospace engineer, major, major accident investigator, and deputy director for regional operations. He has worked as an air safety investigator with Cessna Aircraft Company and a safety engineer with the U.S. Naval Air Systems Command. He joined the FAA in 2014 after a four-year stint as the Assistant Inspector General for Aviation Audits at the Department of Transportation's Office of the Inspector General. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Gazzetti. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, and I got to tell you, it's a privilege, I think, for you all to be here because rarely can you get this kind of a... Uh, uh, an instructor set together to kind of give you a soup to nuts in a concentrated period of time about an accident or an incident investigation. And as Tim indicated, you know, it's a participatory process. Uh, it's, it, it, you don't just, you shouldn't be passive. If you happen to have an accident or an incident and then just let the government come in, come in and do their thing, you need to know what they're doing, you need to know what your privileges are. And there's a lot of them, as Tim outlined. I'm going to talk a little bit about the FAA's perspective and the FAA's role uh, in the investigation. Um, so unlike the NTSB, the FAA does not have a congressional mandate to investigate every single aviation accident, right? I mean, the NTSB has to do that. They have, to, uh, they have primacy. They lead the investigation into every aviation accident. The FAA does not. However, the FAA does have lots of statutory requirements like uh, enhancing aviation safety, promoting safety through regulations, reducing and eliminating accidents, and uh, they're also told by Congress to take action with respect to aviation safety, and that includes investigations. 
So the FAA has authority to investigate. Could be an enforcement investigation, could be a safety investigation, an air traffic investigation. So the best way for the FAA to accomplish all of our statutory assignments is to uh, investigate accidents. So we have an internal requirement that we get involved in investigating every single accident along with the NTSB and pretty much every single serious incident that happens out there too. So NTSB leads the official investigation. They provide the investigator in charge and they organize all the technical expertise. The FAA is a party to every single NTSB investigation uh, by statute. So, you know, Congress in its wisdom said, listen, you know, the FAA has to be there all the time since they control so much about aviation. We're granting the organization guaranteed party status, which is something that airlines don't have, uh, you know, an engine manufacturer doesn't have, but the FAA does have it. So, uh, and as Tim indicated, we're not, we're part of the FAA Department of Transportation. Uh, we're not, the NTSB is not. There was a time when they were both sister agencies, but that was a while ago. The FAA does not determine, even though we conduct investigations, it's not the public investigation. We do not determine the probable cause. Um, we do designate an FAA IIC. Now, NTSB might say, hey, you know, there's really only one investigator in charge, and that's the NTSB. So we say, okay, fine, inside the FAA we have an FAA IIC, but externally we have a, a coordinator, a, an FAA coordinator, just like any company would have a coordinator. The party system is the great equalizer. FAA is no higher on a pecking order than, you know, a helicopter company, a helicopter manufacturer, any other party. We are a party to the organization. We provide a party coordinator. We support the NTSB investigation, just like all of you should if you're involved, but we have our own internal responsibilities too that we piggyback on the investigation. It's called the nine areas of responsibility. And here they are. So in every single accident, there needs to be an internal FAA form that assesses these nine areas because FAA wants to find out whether it's, you know, uh, it's got some problems. And we don't wanna wait six months, a year for the NTSB to tell us what our problems are, we, we can solve it now. And that's the other thing I need to remind you all, if you're gonna be a party to an organization, you don't have to wait for NTSB or anybody to make a safety change within your organization. You could do it looking at the smoking hole, you could pick up a cell phone, and I've seen this done uh, on accident investigations where a, a, uh, an airline uh, official looked at a piece of wreckage picked up the phone and had his fleet grounded. Uh, the airlines can do that. You have the power to do that. Uh, manufacturers can change, uh, can put out changes, service bulletins. Uh, air carriers can change checklists. You don't have to wait for the FAA or the NTSB to tell you what to do. You're inside the yellow line now and you, that gives you a lot of uh, authority. Um, so here we'll look at, uh, you know, did the air traffic controller make a mistake? That's the first one, performance of FAA facilities. If, was it a contract tower or was it a lighting system on a private airport that failed? Uh, was the airplane properly maintained? Uh, was the airman competent? Uh, did the FAA give the airman a proper flight check before the accident? Um, are the regulations adequate? Does the FAA need to change its regulations? Could, could it, is it possible that our regulations are deficient, that, that it led to this accident? Wow, well, we better change it. Um, certification standards. Is there a problem with the way the FAA certified a, a helicopter? Security, uh, aviation security standards or hazmat, you know, flight deck security. Even though TSA is now, since 9-11, is, is in control of airport security, the FAA still owns the security of the flight deck and uh, FAA facilities. Um, medical qualifications, you know, did the pilot have a uh, airman certificate? Did the AME do due diligence in certifying the pilot? Uh, and then of course, were there any violations of, of federal regulations? So these are the nine areas that the FAA is concerned with and that we document. So NTSB, the priority is, they have priority over all investigations, however, 
nothing impairs the authority of another federal agency to conduct accidents or incident investigations. So FAA is free to conduct its own investigations. We just can't obstruct or impede the NTSBs while we do it. So we work with them. And we're actually a good force multiplier for the NTSB, okay? So Tim indicated 125 total, or 128 uh, for aviation. Well, guess what? The FAA has 47,000 employees, this massive bureaucracy, right? Uh, 4,000 of them are flight standards inspectors across these 100 FISDOs across the country. And, uh, and then you have a lot of air traffic controllers and aircraft certification engineers. You're more than likely going to run into a FISDO inspector than you are an NTSB uh, investigator. Because if you're going to be, if you see an NTSB investigator at the accident site, it means there's been some badness, okay? There's been some death or serious injury or a big issue. But like Tim indicated, most of uh, the 12, 1,300 accidents that happen each year, and I think maybe only 120 of those are rotorcraft, uh, they're, you know, they're fender benders or they're engine failures or they're something that, uh, that the FAA can be the eyes and ears of the NTSB at the accident site with these 4,000 inspectors. So you don't have to tap into the 50 or 60 field investigators that have to write the reports on all this stuff. So um, we're force multipliers for them. It's a big advantage to the NTSB, uh, but it can also be a, a challenge, and I'll talk about that in just, a, in just a moment. So here is our policy for accident investigation. You can find it on the internet. It's FAA Order 8020.11c. If you just Google that, it'll, it, you'll, you'll come up with it. It's called the Aircraft Accident and Incident Notification Investigation Reporting. It's, it's basically the FAA's playbook for how an employee or how the FAA plays with the NTSB in an investigation and also how the FAA investigates its own accidents and incidents and what they do with the information. Uh, it's soon to be updated, by the way. We're weeks away from uh, the order being updated to include these new things called like unmanned aircraft systems and commercial space. Uh, um, so we have our policy for that. We get, every day, we get preliminary notifications of accidents or incidents. It usually comes through air traffic or maybe a local sheriff will call a local FISDO and this form gets written up. Just to, also just to advertise, our office goes through these forms every day. And if it's an accident or, a, or an incident of certain import, off-field landings, uh, something like that, we'll actually put it on our website within 24 hours. It'll just be very, you know, who, uh, where it happened, what happened, the end number, which FISDO is investigating. And you can find that also on our website. We keep a 10-day running total. Manufacturers like it because they can say, okay, because we categorize it by was it a rotorcraft, was it a Boeing, was it a, and was it fatal, was it not fatal? So we, my office at FAA, we take in all this information and then the next day it's posted on the, uh, what's called the Asias web portal. So what's our methodology? Well, just as Tim indicated, you know, we can ramp up or ramp down the resources needed for an investigation. We're not gonna launch a go team on a Robinson R-22 where the pilot says, I ran out of gas, I'm sorry, okay? You don't need to expend resources for no safety payback. But, you know, we might launch, NTSB may launch a go team on an air tour accident to kill seven people or, uh, uh, you know, something like that. It's, it's, so you ramp up your rent. So for a major investigation, if the NTSB is gonna launch more than one investigator or someone like Cheech, one of their specialists, or someone uh, from headquarters, NTSB, our office will handle it. We'll actually, uh, uh, in fact, we even provide a lift to the GO team at times using FAA airplanes. Um, so in the helicopter world, fatal helicopter air ambulance accidents, air tour helicopter accidents, anything that's a commercial aviation where the, the paying public, where the public trust has been disturbed for whatever, uh, you're gonna have a specialist out of my office launch to be the FAA coordinator. Non-major events, which can include single fatal personal helicopter accidents or, or fender benders, you're gonna have an inspector, an FAA inspector out there. Uh, and each FISDO is gonna have a duty officer assigned for that week. It could be an avionics person, it could be a, a maintenance inspector, it could be an ops inspector, it could be a big airline, airplane guy that knows nothing about helicopters. They're gonna go out there and they're gonna be the, the party coordinator. 
They all get trained, these 4,000 inspectors get trained at a two-week course down at tr the Transportation Safety Institute in Oklahoma City. Uh, it's, uh, then they get some on-the-job training, and um, they're, it's a collateral duty for them for the on-scene portion of the investigation. So for the GO team, so this is uh, uh, for the higher visibility, you'll see uh, some of our senior, in fact, we have Matt Rigsby. Matt, where are you? There you are. Matt Rigsby uh, is one of the six. I, I like to call him the SEAL Team Six of accident investigations. And Pat Hempen. Pat, where are you? There you are right there. Um, and then we have uh, four other very senior investigators that either worked at a FISDO or designed helicopters or, or whatever. Um, these are the helicopter accidents that uh, we, my office, is launched on because, you know, they were high visibility enough where we wanted to be the coordinator. These are all the helicopter accidents uh, we had, uh, uh, and we also launch on foreign accidents, too, whenever the NTSB goes to a foreign country to investigate a U.S. certified or operated product. Um, so uh, for all the rest of them, you're going to see an FAA inspector from one of the 79 FLISDOs or the 18 certificate management offices. Uh, and, and, and so we're, we're kind of spread out. We can really help the NTSB with on-scene investigation. So as Tim indicated, I won't dwell on this. For most non-fatal helicopter accidents, they're limited. Uh, NTSB won't send an investigator. And, and if they're an incident, because there's two, 3,000 incidents that FAA investigates that the NTSB doesn't at all, um, uh, you probably won't see an NTSB person. You'll see a local inspector. The FAA cannot use the information collected exclusively for an NTSB investigation for enforcement, okay? So that's, that's important for you to know. Um, if the NTSB is directing an FAA inspector, hey, I need this for my investigation, I need this for my investigation, we're doing this investigation, uh, you need to be part of this. The FAA cannot use the information they glean from the NTSB's safety investigation against you. If they try, the case will be dismissed by an administrative law judge. Um, so we try to make sure the FAA coordinator is not the same person that might be your, your principal ops inspector or your principal maintenance inspector. We try to separate the enforcement from the safety. Um, so the FAA will not use flight crew statements given during the accident investigation as evidence in enforcement actions. The FAA will not use CVR transcripts or any information from the CVR for enforcement actions. The FAA will not participate in an NTSB interview if the person being interviewed asks the NTSB if the FAA can get out of the room. Uh, so we. I mean, we don't have to do that, but we want to do that. We don't want to ha have a chilling effect when the NTSB is interviewing a pilot or a mechanic. Uh, I will tell you, though, that if that happens, the NTSB will tell the person being interviewed, well, okay, the, the FAA will be outside of the room, but as soon as we're done with you, when you walk out of the room, the FAA will now interview you under their own authority uh, for enforcement, potential enforcement action. So it's... It's, usually that doesn't happen too often. And the FAA person in the room is handpicked, agreed to by the NTSB to be part of the, uh, that group. The FAA will collect evidence independently from the NTSB investigation. We have our own mission, continuing operational safety, uh, regulatory compliance. So we'll, we'll, we'll collect information outside of the NTSB investigation for our own purposes. We have our own NTS, or excuse me, FAA form. It's called the 8020-323. It's like a three or four page form. It's internal. It can be FOIA'd. Uh, and on this form, the inspector checks one of the nine areas that I talked about earlier on whether they think that was involved. Yes or no? Was there a, do, you, do you suspect a violation was involved? Yes. And then you have to put a short comment about what you think the potential violation was. But then that investigator in charge, FAA investigator in charge, should not be the one that might move forward with a letter of investigation or enforcement action or anything like that. We try to keep the two separated uh, as best as we can. So um, these forms are completed within 30 days, okay? So FISDO inspectors are busy. It, accident investigation is a collateral duty for them. They're in, they're out, they show up, you know, they, they collect a little bit of information, they, they assist the NTSB, 
their boss is back at the FISDO saying, I need you to conduct this check rod, and you need to do this in maintenance inspection, you need to fill out this paperwork, you need to get the G car back into the barn. I mean, it's, it's uh, we don't have the luxury of having dedicated accident investigators, and we'd like to. I'm trying to work at uh, putting together a smaller cadre of FAA inspectors that are dedicated to accident and incident investigation, as opposed to it being a collateral duty. But right now, the system is, NTSB does the full-blown report pub publicly, probable cause. The FAA collects a little bit of information and, and feeds it into their own internal system. There's something called an Ashburn Accord I won't go too far into, but you know, there's times where if a helicopter operator has an accident, the local FAA shows up immediately, says, I want to see your maintenance records. I want to talk to your director of ops. I want to do it now. We got some concerns about your operation. Meanwhile, the NTSB's like, whoa, whoa, we're in charge of this investigation. We'll set up the interview with, for the director of ops. We'll get the maintenance record secured. And the FAA's like, well, no, we've got continuing operational safety, NTSB. You, you know, you, and the NTSB's like, well, we're in charge of this investigation. So we don't want a chilling effect. We don't want you to obstruct anything. We need to coordinate this. The Ashburn Accord says if that happens, uh, there needs to be a... a, a a, an interagency communications call can happen 24-7. You get all the players. Okay, FAA, what information do you need? Why is this so urgent? Uh, okay, NTSB, why is it going to take you two days to get here? We're already here. Is there any way we can? So we work it out. Uh, we work it out. NTSB does have primacy over the investigation, but FAA, and the NTSB would agree, the FAA shouldn't sit back and just wait when they've got an issue that they think they can immediately put out an emergency or worthiness directive, or they can uh, uh, pull the certificate for an operator. So, uh, you know, there needs to be communication and coordination, and that is very important. I'm just going to fly through uh, UASs. If we, wouldn't, if we have more time, it, you know, UASs are now an accident for both NTSB and FAA. Right now, the protocols are generally the same. The FAA, for, for commercial UAS operations, for the first time in its history, has an accident investigation form on its, uh, where they have to immediately report to the FAA. The NTSB also has similar recommendations, and there's actually some differences between the two. So I've kind of uh, uh, put that out there in this, this chart. There's different damage thresholds and injury thresholds. And, um, and I will tell you that for Part 107, they do mix safety and enforcement with regards to UAS investigations. Um, and uh, uh, I just quickly wanted to mention senior leadership. Our se some of our senior leaders will be here in, on Thursday, I think John Duncan for the Meet the Regulator session. Uh, um, and we have two new, uh, Peggy Gilligan has retired, so Ali Barami is the new uh, AVS-1. And right now, Jim Viola, some of you may know him as the acting AVS-2. Uh, this is flight standards, John Duncan is the, in charge of all those FISDOs. And uh, Dorenda Baker is in charge of uh, aircraft certification. And um, I don't know if he's here. Is Jorge here, uh, Matt? Um, we have uh, Jorge from, uh, used to be the Rotorcraft Directorate, but the aircraft, uh, the re, the re, and I'll get to that in a second. The restructuring of the uh, aircraft certification got rid of the name Directorate. So there really is no Rotorcraft Directorate anymore. Um, but you know, those same people were still around. And then this is our office, very small office, uh, the Office of Accident Investigation and Prevention. Last slide, miscellaneous but important stuff, public aircraft. Okay, the NTSB is still, in, if, if you operate a public aircraft, the state of Utah, state police, or uh, the Department of Energy or whatever, the NTSB, if you crash, the NTSB is still in charge of your investigation. However, the FAA, they're going to be involved, but only to the extent of their, uh, those nine areas of, air, uh, of, of responsibility were they involved in that. Um, USHST, the FAA, is very much involved in, in that effort. We have uh, Scott Terrell here um, and others. There's Scott over there who's been involved with that. Uh, we have something called the compliance philosophy. If you don't know about this, you should read up on it. It's a new philosophy that the, F that the flight standards has with regards to uh, overseeing operators. Um, improved communications, identification, mitigations of hazards, carrot versus the stick. 
but the stick is still there for the FAA if there's egregious or repetitive or negligence in, uh, in mistakes or violations with a carrier. Um, future flight standards, flight standards is being reorganized. There's now four major areas, air carrier, general aviation, standards, and foundational business. I think most of the helicopter folks will come under either the uh, 135 air carrier or the general aviation aspect of it. And air transformation, uh, aircraft certification is also uh, redoing it. Um, these are just some of the things, the charts that the FAA uh, puts together every month. The rotorcraft folks uh, in aircraft certification, Scott Terrell and others. And you can see there's been, a, there's been a pretty good decline in helicopter accidents for total. But that red line down below, it's, it's, it's too flat. And we need to continue to work on that. Um, and I'll just skip through that. And that's, uh, that's really all I have with regards to the FAA's role in accident and incident investigation. Thank you, Jeff. All righty. Our last panelist chairs the aviation practice of the national law firm of LeClaire Ryan. He and his team of 20 lawyers provide national and international representation to the full range of aviation industry, including airlines, cargo operators, helicopter operators, airports, MROs, FBO, and others. He started his career as an FAA attorney and then as head of the aviation unit for the U.S. Department of Justice. Over his 40-year career, he has assisted his clients, including helicopter operators, through hundreds, as well as uh, hundreds, excuse me, of NTSB as well as military accident investigations, and more often than not, the claims and litigations which follow them. Among some of the higher-profile investigations he assisted his clients through was the Virgin Galactic spaceship explosion, U.S. Airways Flight 1549, the Miracle on the Hudson and in recent engine fire involving American Airlines Flight 383 at O'Hare Airport, as well as numerous NTSB investigations involving both military and civilian helicopter accidents. Please join me in welcoming Mark Dumbroff. Thank you. Um, I can't help but notice that the introduction was classically lawyer-like. It was short, it was pithy, and it was grossly understated. Um, <laughs> There are three great lies in this country. The first is the check is in the mail. The second is, of course, I'll love you in the morning. And the third is, I'm a lawyer, and I'm here to help you. Um, I, I think I, Jeff and Tim have done a great job explaining the role of their agencies. Uh, but they're representing their agencies. They're representing the system. My role in an investigation and everything that follows the event is to assist you. We represent operators, we represent manufacturers, and <clears throat> we represent the parties to the investigation. Now let me make one thing absolutely clear. The accident investigation system in this country, the aviation regulatory system in this country is absolutely the gold standard throughout the world. There is no better body than the NTSB in terms of accident investigation. There is no better body in terms of aviation regulation than the FAA. And if there's any question about that, just think about the uh, safety record of the commercial airline industry. In terms of 2017, not a single jet fatality. It is an extraordinary system. Having said that, they've explained to you what the regulations say, what the procedures say, and now I'm going to explain to you how a lot of it really works. Because once you're in the middle of the system, it's really not a function of going back to the procedures and going back to the regulations. A lot of it has to do with how the system really works in real life, in real time. Why do I need a lawyer? Do I really need a lawyer? The answer is, if you don't have a lawyer and your company is involved in an accident, you are making a serious mistake before you ever get started. Because everything that you have heard about, with the exception of the final NTSB report and the probable cause, and when I talk about the final NTSB report, I'm not talking about the group chairman reports or the factual reports. Everything but the final report 
is admissible against you in litigation. So the reason you need a lawyer is not necessarily in the context of the investigation itself, although we will see why you need a lawyer, but more because the investigation itself is just the beginning of a much longer process. By a show of hands, how many of you have been involved in litigation arising out of an accident? Either as a witness or number of hands are going up. You folks truly do have an understanding of how some of this plays out. In the context of the NTSB process, a lawyer, as we'll talk about, can be of tremendous assistance to you in getting through the process. For one thing, you are in the midst of, a, of an event which is not going to slow down, and I frequently describe the accident investigation process like a whole series of trains leaving the station all at once. You have the accident investigation. You have, as Jeff talked about, the FAA and their enforcement responsibilities. You have the media. You have shareholders, owners of your company, the financial elements. You have your employees. It's an enormously active period of time, and the only entity that is on every one of these trains is likely going to be the operator. And hopefully, if the operator has a good safety record, the operator has no experience, which handicaps them enormously in terms of the process moving forward. These trains do not slow down for you to catch up. The FAA, as Jeff talked about, also has the mandate in terms of aviation safety. They are going to be investigating whether you violated the regulations. The net result of that could be enforcement action against an individual or certificate action against the company or monetary penalty against the company. You have your insurer on the scene. The insurer has certain responsibilities. Typically, those responsibilities during the accident investigation are writing checks because that's why you paid your premium. You have your own company in terms of other employees, former employees. There is nothing better than an accident to bring disgruntled former employees out of their holes to talk about the fact that I told them this was going to happen. You have the media, and one very important thing that Tim talked about is how you deal with the media. And the simple rule that I tell every one of my clients, and the worst place to meet me, folks, the worst place to meet me is around the smoking hole. That is the worst place to establish a relationship for, for the first time. The reason being that that is the worst time for you. So the relationship should be established, as we'll talk about, well before there's ever an accident. And you have media and social media. And the simple rule in terms of dealing with the media as a party to an investigation is you can say nothing after the accident that you couldn't say before the accident. We have the following safety record, we have maintenance programs, we have safety programs, our pilots were very experienced, they had all these hours. Everything that could have been said but for an accident can be said after an accident without stepping over the NTSB line. And if there's any question in your mind as to whether or not the NTSB will throw you out of the investigation, I assure you they will throw you out of the investigation if you step over that line. And then you are outside of the investigation, subject to being investigated, but not being on the inside in terms of participating. And then finally, you have the claimants. We heard Matt talk about this morning, the claimants, the families, the passengers. And they want information. And you need to deal with them, because that's where this is ultimately all going to move to. Let's talk about NTSB Form 6120.1. It's the form that uh, Tim talked about that you can find at ntsb.gov. It's the notification to the NTSB that the accident has occurred. It's a very comprehensive form, and shame on all of you if you fill out that form without having a lawyer look at it before it's submitted. You cannot believe how many of those forms I have seen where the person filling it out has speculated about the cause of the accident, has talked about the remedial measures they are going to take, have talked about the past problems that the company has had in this particular area. And all of that is admissible against you in litigation. 
and none of it is necessary in terms of completing that form. Take a look at that form. Another thing I'll tell you is the NTSB does not expect you to indict yourself on that form. So take a look at that form and make sure that the lawyer looks at it. Now let's talk about lawyers for a second. I am not a corporate lawyer. I have been representing aviation entities in connection with accidents, incidents, emergency preparedness, emergency response for 40 years. You would not come to me to write a will. You would not come to me to do a stock issuance or to set up your corporation. Do not go to the lawyer that you would have do those things if you get in an accident. Go to a lawyer who knows what they're doing in that world. The consequences of these types of accidents, you saw on the, uh, on the slide that Jeff presented, the accident, I think it was February 10th at the Grand Canyon, five fatalities. The Troy Gentry accident, litigation just started in that accident in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, I believe. How many of you just read about the settlement involving the flight nurse by one of the aeromedical companies and the manufacturer? $100 million to settle one case. $100 million. Do not go to your corporate lawyer, please. Document management. One of the things you will find yourself subjected to immediately after the accident is a request for documents, a demand for documents. It'll come from the NTSB, it may come from the FAA, it may come from others. You've got to have a control system in place. Do I turn over originals versus copies? My advice always to every client is never turn over originals. Always maintain the originals, give the NTSB copies. If they want to compare the copies to the originals, they're free to do so. Isolate the originals, keep them under lock and key, make sure every document you supply to the NTSB has the watermark proprietary and confidential across the face of it, every single page. Why? Tim told you, Jeff told you, everything that you provide to the NTSB or to the FAA is subject to Freedom of Information Act requests by the public, and you can read the public as being the media and the plaintiff's lawyers. So by putting proprietary and confidential across every document, it is not subject to disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act unless the agency comes back to you and asks you to remove that watermark. And the relationship that we always establish with the NTSB is that if you want us to remove that watermark on any particular document for the purpose of including it in your group chairman report, which is admissible in litigation, just ask the company and we'll look at it. Make sure you suspend any document destruction policy. In other words, don't allow documents that may be relevant to an accident or a maintenance program that could be involved or a training program or any other program get destroyed as part of an ongoing document destruction policy. And put a litigation hold out. Send a memo out to various parts of the company, if appropriate, that explains to them the fact that there's an investigation going on, there may be claims or litigation, but hold on to these categories of documents. What about witnesses? I would never permit one of your employees, whether it's a surviving crew member, it's the vice president of operations, the head of safety, the head of training, I would never permit one of your employees to be interviewed by the NTSB as part of the accident investigation without having them prepared by an attorney. I would never permit one of your employees to be interviewed without having an attorney sitting in the interview with them during the investigation. NTSB rules permit that. And one important thing to know 
is that in the context of aviation accidents, and it's different for different investigators in different modes of transportation investigated by the NTSB, verbatim records, excuse me, with respect to the court reporters that we all see on television, are not made of interviews generally. Some IICs or some investigators acting as group chairman may do that, but generally that's not done. Generally what happens is the investigator who is doing the interview, the NTSB investigator, will take out the recorder, they'll say, do you mind if I record this? I am only going to use this as a memory aid when I prepare the account of the interview, solely for that purpose. And what gets prepared is, in fact, an account of an interview, a third-person account. So-and-so was interviewed on such-and-such -such a date. He stated the following things. It's an account. It's a narrative of an interview. And generally speaking, the investigator will not permit either the employee or the lawyer representing the employee to review that draft before it's put in the public record. They will allow your representative on that group, if they were sitting in the room, to review it, but generally not the witness. That will get used in litigation against you later on. How can these materials be used? As I said, everything but the final report of the board. Now, there's a statute, and some of you may think that, well, the statute says that no report of the NTSB can be used in any litigation. What the statute says is no board report. And the way the courts have interpreted that is what's called the Blue Book Report. For each different mode of transportation, the NTSB has a different color cover. And aviation accidents have a blue cover. The way the courts have interpreted the statute is that is the only report of the board with a capital B, the five presidentially appointed members. That's the only report that, as a general rule, is not admissible in litigation. That report is not even prepared until the very end of the investigation. But everything else, whether it's the docket, the exhibits, the interviews, the group chairman notes, everything else is usable against you in litigation. It is free discovery. The final report is not, and as a general rule, you may not depose during litigation an NTSB investigator. Even though we can reach out and issue a subpoena, as a general rule, you will not be able to depose the investigator. Why? The board has 400 plus employees, 129, I think, in the Office of Aviation Safety over which John presides. They don't have enough time to be involved in litigation. The only way you can depose an NTSB investigator is to write a letter to the general counsel of the NTSB, ask for the deposition, and explain why it is necessary and why you can't get the information out of the reports. And if need be, and when I was at Justice, my largest client was the FAA, and we represented all the military services as well, as well as the NTSB, we would go to court to have notices of deposition and subpoenas quashed that people had sought in terms of getting the deposition of the NTSB investigator for the very reasons I've just explained to you, which is why you are at the mercy of materials being developed on the day the investigation starts, which is why it is critical to have an attorney involved. They should be involved as early as whenever you have your emergency response drills, your tabletop drills, whether it's every six months, whether it's once a year. Please do not let it become a check-the-box exercise and it goes back on the shelf for another year. Please do not let it become a situation where he's going to have the accident pointing to the guy next to you, not my company. That's the time to understand how these things get used. That's the time to meet somebody like me before you ever have the accident. That's the time to invite one of Tim's investigators to sit in on your tabletop drill, to invite the local FISDO chief, manager, accident investigator, or designated investigator who Jeff might reach out to. That's the time to meet these people. Have your broker there, your insurer there. 
in terms of your base of operations, invite the airport operations people and the ARF people there. Have your lawyer there. The NTSB submission, we ran a symposium two weeks ago. It was our 12th annual aviation symposium that we run in Washington every year. And Robert Sumwalt, who I go back 25 years with when Robert was at the uh, US Airways, uh, who's now the chairman of the NTSB, Robert pointed out two absolute requirements. One is you must make a submission to the NTSB. You must. And, and um, Tim talked about this. I cannot emphasize that too strongly. We represent an extraordinarily sophisticated aerospace manufacturer. And we asked them when we got involved, it was well after the fact, and, and I think uh, John DeLisi knows exactly who I'm talking about, did you ever make a submission to the NTSB? And they said no. Well, are you planning on meeting with the board members before the board meeting where they're going to adopt the probable cause? No. Well, why not? We never do those things. One of the other parties, who was the airframe manufacturer, had made a submission. And the airframe manufacturer, in order to protect its brand, pointed the finger at our client. But our client said, well, we don't do that. Well, in that case, we did set up meetings with the board members, and we were successful in pointing out why the submission that the airframe manufacturer made was, in fact, inaccurate. You must make a submission. You present it to the board. Then prior to their sunshine meeting, it's referred to as the sunshine meeting, it's the public meeting of the board members, the presidentially appointed members, where they adopt the probable cause. Prior to that, you should meet with the board members, and they are all open to it, and that was the second absolute must that the chairman of the NTSB talked about two weeks ago. You must make a submission, you must meet with the board members, and I will tell you, having sat in on countless of those meetings, with my clients, they are receptive to it, they are anxious to have it. Frequently John or a member of his team sits in on those meetings and it's your opportunity, your only opportunity to tell that board member why you believe the accident report should reflect the following findings. It's your opportunity to discuss your submission. The role of counsel, we go to all of these in part because we know all the people at the board, and in part because we help prepare you to make the most persuasive presentation. And then finally, you've got litigation. As I told you, the Troy Gentry accident happened, I forgot exactly when it happened. Almost a year ago. Almost a year ago. Litigation started about three, three weeks ago, a month ago. It's not unusual for litigation to be filed right away. The location can be where you are, could be where the accident is. It's wherever the plaintiff's lawyer can get jurisdiction over the various defendants they want to name. And that's why the litigation hold memorandum is so important, so that documents are not being destroyed, documents are being controlled, you know exactly what has been given to the NTSB, because everything that is on the public docket is usable in the litigation. So if you think about it, even before a complaint is ever filed, the plaintiff's lawyer already has this, this government investigation providing to them all the input they need, at least in their minds, to prove their case. With that having been said, let me thank you. You should check out our blog, plainlyspoken.com. Plainly it's got terrific links to a lot of other information and my contact information, and thank you very much, and thank you to uh, HAI for having me. All right, thank you, Mark. And thank you for all of our panelists for participating today. At this time, we're going to open up the uh, floor to questions. We have uh, two microphones in the back that will be going around the room. If you uh, please raise your hand or stand, uh, we can come directly to you to uh, have you ask your question. Good morning. I was wondering, is there, are there any situations where the NTSB or the FAA 
become involved in uh, DOD or DHS investigations? And is there any sharing of information regarding that? Well, I'll, from the FAA standpoint, D, DOD or DHS, uh, that's really kind of two different entities. Uh, DOD is strictly military. Uh, they have their own investigative procedures. The FAA, if asked by the military to investigate or to be involved because an, it was an FAA controller that ran two airplanes together or if it was a Gulfstream that's built and certified by the FAA but now is being operated by military, we would have limited involvement with that. But it's on an ad hoc, case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then if, uh, uh, well, Tim, you could probably answer from the NTSB. Yeah, standpoint. so the way that I look at it, uh, did it have an in number on it? If it has an in number, uh, then most likely, yes, we will investigate. Um, so then if you have a military aircraft and a civilian that get together accident where there's substantial damage, then the NTSB does lead that investigation. DHS, though, I mean, not, now you're talking public operations, uh, unless it's an intelligence gathering uh, uh, type of agency, which we don't get involved in. We don't either. Uh, if the spooks are involved, as we call them, then no. But Mark, you probably well, know. yeah. Let me. Let me I think I think it's a great question, and the uh, you know sort of the broad answer is yes. Um, and and the reason I say yes in terms of NTSB getting involved or FAA getting involved is, and I think both Jeff and Tim are right. Uh, my experience is there are lots of instances where, and I'm thinking back to a number of the either military accidents, pure military accidents, or transcom related operations where N number aircraft are involved where, um, you know, even accidents outside the United States where they may be ICAO Annex 13 accidents, uh, where a foreign country may in fact request the NTSB to take over the investigation or participate in the investigation. I think the military, you know, I've, I've been involved in an incredible number of military accidents. They tend because of, uh, if it's a pure military accident, let's say a fighter, you know, where the pilot punches out and the airplane hits a, well, it didn't American Samoa, it hit a hotel, um, uh, where the, the military tends to really, you know, build a wall around the investigation, and then you, you find yourself, even as an operator, um, if you're involved in one of those types of accidents, not with the fighter, unless you're a supplier, um, you really find yourself navigating the safety board investigation versus the JAG investigation, which I always found the concept uh, while I defended it for, you know, 15 years at Justice, the JAG investigation, namely a lawyer out of the Judge Advocate General's office who has absolutely no uh, specialized experience necessarily in aviation, leading an aviation investigation for the purpose of laying liability, a scary proposition. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very ad hoc, as these guys suggest. I think it's something you've got to be very careful about as an operator. So an example, um, uh, the Air Force uh, does a lot of their training in, uh, through contracts. So they're yeah. military pilots getting trained by civilian in in-registered aircraft. Fighter aircraft, um, Kefirs or? Yeah, maybe. The ones I'm thinking of, a lot of them, uh, they're in Colorado, uh, you know, there for a while. In fact, just until recently, they had Super Cubs that uh, they were training pilots in. Right, flight screening. Yeah, so it was a, a, a military pilots, but civilian instructor and in numbered airplane. Let, so let me, let me add, just pick up on that thought as well. From your perspective, you know, if you're talking about liability and the job I play in terms of helping you get through, my, you know, sir, my job is to help you get through the investigation and then deal with everything that occurs afterwards, help you deal with that. Nothing changes. You know, you, we may not be dealing with the NTSB in the same way. Uh, but you can just substitute, we're dealing with, with the military. Um, and now you're starting to talk about whether it's the military services, or you're talking about Transcom and the CARB. I don't know how many of you know what the CARB is uh, out of Scott Air Force Base. But it, it's really all the same considerations involving different agencies. So at the end of the day, you know, when you're dealing with military accidents, the big you know, thing you got to recognize is if service members killed in the context of the performance of their military responsibilities in an aircraft accident, they can't sue the United States. So they're going to end up suing whether you're a manufacturer or if you're a civilian operator providing 
training, they can't sue the United States. So um, again, all, from my perspective, uh, all the considerations are the same. Good morning. I'm uh, Mark Colborn. I'm a tactical flight officer, pilot, and an instructor for the Dallas Police Department Helicopter Unit. I am also have been a member of the United States Helicopter Team uh, and International Helicopter Safety Team for the past 11 years. Um, I have a comment for Tim. When we first started um, back in, when I first joined the group, we ran into a lot of data issues with the NTSB reports that we reviewed for our accident analysis. And our, um, basically our chairmen of our group came before the board and introduced a helicopter checklist for, uh, to aid us in future analysis. And first of all, I wanted to thank the NTSB for, uh, for adopting that helicopter accident checklist. And I also like, um, and thank, uh, we've seen those reports show up in the accidents that we've uh, invest, or we've analyzed um, since that report was adopted. And it's helped us considerably with our analysis. And uh, again, I want to thank the NTSB for that and also encourage, as, as a supervisor, uh, please encourage your uh, two C's to keep using that uh, checklist because it's very helpful for, uh, for us in the, in, in, the, in the analysis arena. So I, I appreciate that. And um, so I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. Um, it seems like every conference I go to, I get a group that comes up and says, hey, we have a supplemental form we want your investigators to do. Um, understand that I believe that information is very, very important. But what I'd like to do is take your checklist and incorporate it in our normal data entry program. So instead of having a separate checklist that our investigators have to do, my goal is that we review it, and if it's good stuff, it needs to be in our, our the data management system. Um, so I appreciate that, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Get away from your supplemental form and actually make it part of our system. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for participating today. I really appreciate the quality of our panel today. Uh, my name is Terry Palmer, and I'm the chairman of the HAI Training Committee. And I, of course, have a question about training. So I'd like to know how much emphasis does the NTSB put on pilot or mechanic training when investigating an accident? I know that uh, uh, SA031 recommended the use of simulators for helicopter pilots, but I'd like to know if you look at training or the lack of training in investigating an accident. Sure. So if you've ever seen one of our investigators do a, a, a presser or a press conference, uh, you'll probably hear them say that we look at the person, the machine, and the environment. And so certainly underneath of the person, the pilot, uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, what was their training? What were their credentials? Uh, so in short, absolutely. Do you also look at training in other forms of transportation in, in different accidents? Well, I can't speak for the other modes, um, but I feel pretty safe in saying yes. I'm sure it's part of any, any investigation. You've got to look at the training. You know, for rail, I can't speak for, for rail, but I, I don't know what credentials those individuals need, but I'm sure it involves training. Uh, so again, I, I feel pretty safe saying yes. Thank if I, you. If I could just piggyback that question plus the previous one about the helicopter checklist. Uh, you know, there's going to be some accidents that they're just, uh, you know, like I said, you could send a go team on every single accident. Uh, I can tell you that certainly the NTSB is all over training when it comes to some of these higher visibility commercial operations. I mean, that, this pilot was trained to be a professional pilot. It's just part of their normal, uh, you know, and the FAA's normal thing. Where who trained them? Uh, what kind of flight hours? If you're starting to talk about the Part 91 world. Um, it's a little, it's, there, there just aren't enough investigators around to perhaps 
do that kind of a deep dive. You could say the same thing about human factors. Uh, so it's really kind of resource uh, limited at times, but uh, certainly for the ones that are, uh, you know, for professional pilots, it's, it's a normal part of the... Uh, yeah, but, but, I, but I, I will say that even on those data collection investigations, we're looking to see, was it a, a licensed pilot? That involves training. Do they have a biannual flight review? You know, that's training. So we do look at that stuff. And so I agree with, with Jeff. Some we do a deeper dive than others. But on every investigation, we look at training. I, you know, I, I can't think of a single, I, I don't care whether it's fixed, fixed wing or, or a helicopter or even the spaceship accident where uh, there wasn't a deep dive by the NTSB into the training of the pilots, the training program. Um, we have document retention lists that we provide uh, to operators that say in the event you have an event, uh, here are all the documents you should separate out and start to collect. And it doesn't include just the pilot's training records, it includes the, the training programs, the curricula, it includes everything that that pilot may have gone through. Not necessarily because the board or the FAA is going to look at the same in-depth uh, uh, examination that that we're asking that the documents be collected on, but I will tell you that the plaintiff's lawyer is going to do that. So um, we, we like to get out way in front of this stuff, but training is, you know, it's just core to the investigation. Mark, is that part of the uh, process for your emergency preparedness that you provide to your clients? Yeah, yeah you know, we, um, uh, as I said, the worst time to meet, well, the worst time to meet any of us is after your accident. You know, getting to know people around a smoking hole is not really conducive to building relationships. Um, one of the things that we do is we help operators who don't have big internal structures. You take the United American Delta Southwest, the big operators, even big helicopter operators, they have more of an internal structure by way of resources. but. We take, we will help companies structure emergency response drills. And one of the things we do is we've actually got a, I think it's a 369 page uh, emergency response handbook that's a resource. And if any of you are interested in it, just let me know, we give it away. Uh, and it's got, Tarek, it's got the whole list of checklists of, you know, sort of what to do before, during, and after the event. So I piggyback on what Mark said, and he said it in his presentation too, that uh, the last time to meet us is at the time of an accident. And so uh, we have investigators. So if you have a, your company wants to have uh, an NTSB investigator come out and talk about the process with you, uh, we do that kind of thing. So uh, email me, call me, whatever, and if we can support that, we certainly will do that. I'll tell you, one of the events I got involved with with the NTSB was your externship program, and I thought that was phenomenal, where you guys came out you know, before the accident and want to learn a little bit more about the organization and operation, and I think it was beneficial for uh, both the regulator side as well as the operators. Is that something you guys still are involved in? The externship? Mm -hmm. I think John, I'll throw that to you. <laughs> are we still doing the externship? Uh, That would be great. You know, just in terms of building the relationship, one of the things I would advise everybody here, if, if you do find yourself in Washington, um, you want to call these guys and, and make arrangements to come by and visit them. Um, it's one way to build those relationships, to meet the people before you have the problem. Um, and the one thing I have found about the board, among many others, is they are more than receptive to coming, to having you come to their headquarters uh, and they'll give you a tour of the laboratory. You'll, they'll introduce you to all sorts of folks there. Um, you can do the same thing at Ashburn in their training center. Hopefully that's the last time you ever see them in your professional life. Um, but uh, it built, it's not just a function of seeing the, you know, sort of the cockpit voice recorder lab or the flight data recorder lab. It's a function of building the relationship in the event you ever have to call upon it in the future. Thank you. And more questions? Yeah, good morning. Um, I've been flying a public use aircraft for the last 11 years, 
And I've often wondered, and maybe just more for the FAA folks, why not just the regulation, but from the safety and accident investigation, we're treated, it's just different for the public use aircraft than the civil, and I've often wondered why, because we're in the same airspace, kind of doing the same thing. You are, uh, yeah, it's a good question, and sometimes I often wonder why. We've had, we've come across this all the time. Uh, Maryland State Police uh, crashed a helicopter, and a lot of this came to the fore. The NTSB was asking the FAA, what, what power do you have, uh, you know? And it really comes down to the statutory authority of the FAA over civilian aircraft and uh, the fact that uh, the federal agencies and state agencies to a large degree also have authority to not follow, uh, you know, you, you, to have their own pilot's licenses. Now there are crossovers, the airspace, right? You're gonna be flying in the same airspace, so the FAA has a dog in that fight with regard to, uh, uh, you know, investigating. But in terms of how you maintain your aircraft, you don't have to maintain it uh, as per Part 135 or even 91. Um, uh, you, you could have your own standards about biannual inspections instead of annual inspections or something like that. And the FAA really has no jurisdiction over that unless you enter into a contract with them or you invite them in. Um, so it's really a, it's a legal thing. And, you know, I'm no lawyer, Mark is, and maybe Mark uh, can explain it. Uh, well, I, no, I think Jeff's got it right. It's really the statutory basis. But I think if you sort of look behind the statute, I think the, probably the easiest way to explain it is it's really an extension in some respects of the military flight operations. The FAA has no authority. They do share the airspace, so the, they will observe all of the air traffic restrictions and so forth, but the FAA has no control over the maintenance programs of the military or the training programs of the military and so forth. And I think what you see in the public use space is sort of an extension of that, um, not likely to change. Is there a general consensus up in the headquarters that that's an acceptable procedure and <laughs> just any thoughts of you know some of the regulations that we do not have to follow intrigue me uh, uh, I'll be I mean I'll be candid I, I think they're inside of the FAA I think you have people saying you know why are we why are we allowing this uh, you know um, I, I, but I think the uh, when we were, were in fact we were involved and so is the NTSB on a uh, state police helicopter accident that happened uh, uh, in Virginia recently, and there's been previous state police. And so it's, um, you know, they're at who, what kind of authority do we have? First of all, it's, it's a little bit sketchy for each, you know, there's things about lease agreements and when is it, because a lot of these operators also conduct civilian operations under a 135 and then they switch over and do uh, public use operations. So there's that whole thing. I think in the end, uh, it's, it's, and I, you probably have to, the best compendium, I guess, of this, uh, this tension or this conflict is in the report that the NTSB did on the Maryland State Police accident. Now, Maryland State Police after that said, you know what, we're gonna apply for and get a Part 135 certificate. So we want the FAA to come in. We want their rules. We want to be, so that's what they did. Uh, um, it, but the, it really came down to the statutory, the congressional authorities and FAA doesn't want to get out there and say, you need to be doing this, and then find out that uh, they don't have the authority to do it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very good question. It's still not resolved. I think there's lots of mm -hmm. yin and yang going on with that. And from the NTSB standpoint, I, I, I don't distinguish the difference between the two. So if we go to an investigation, it's the same process that we use for a, a regular certified or Part 91, 135. But you know, there was a time Tim, I think it was 1994 or 95, before they put in a law for the NTSB to have authority over all the public use, that it was, the NTSB kind of picked and choose. Uh, they didn't have the mandate, now you do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it was problematic before 1994 where even public use were even outside, could have been outside of the NTSB's purview. So. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Edward Mitchell. I'm an instructor at Fort Rucker. Uh, I teach uh, uh, IERW guys from day one. Uh, one thing we were trying to do is we do a safety tip 
every morning and a lot of the guys, uh, a lot of the students use the NTSB reports as a briefing on an accident, a causality, um, and trying to figure out as a safety input to help them continue to learn and to become better pilots. And I'm sure some of the other operators do something similar with their pilots in, in safety discussions and stuff like that. How can we use your reports or is there any other um, resources that students, my students could use to better understand the NTSB and the causality of the accidents and get to, to stop the accidents before they ever start? Well, that's a good question and I, I don't know if I have a good answer for you. Uh, outside of going into our reports, uh, going into our docket, I, you know, and I put the invitation out to you all as well, that if uh, it would be helpful to have one of our investigators come speak to your, your folk, we'd certainly be happy to do that as well. Can you think of anything else? Well, I was just going to say, you have the US, USHST's, you know, website, and uh, there's lots of compendiums where you've got professionals that are trending uh, issues that are common in helic and rotorcraft accidents. And, uh, and I also must say, the NTSB does a great job with posting every single accident on their website. It, sometimes it takes a little while to figure out how to do it, um, but it's all there. And then their docket, at least for accidents, maybe up to about, before about 10 years ago, you have to go on microfish, but everything from that point on, it's all there. Uh, so just hard target what you want your lesson to be, and, uh, um, and you can use search uh, engines on the NTSB's website. ASIAS, FAA's ASIAS portal has search engines. So, yeah. uh, thank you guys for your for your panel. Um, a couple things. One, for a shout out for the USHST. So the the safety enhancements is a way to distill, as Mark was saying, all of this information from accidents into something that's digestible. So that. It was a place to absolutely go to the safety enhancements. But my comment was that, it, that I think that going back to Matt's original premise uh, when he started this, the, this discussion this morning, we have to go back, and I think, Mark, that I, as a medical guy, we sort of look at these things from risk and compliance. And one of the things that I think we all have to do is to go back in and look at our organizations from a compliance perspective and, and appreciate your, your your accident, emergency plan things, but that's, we have to learn from what has happened before if we don't want to repeat it again. And I think that there, there really is, I mean, and we do use our lawyers to go in and look at all of our compliance and have we complied with, with what the best knowledge and best practice is. And that's, that's the piece that seems to be constantly missing, that we do all this work, but we're not learning from it fast enough. Uh, let, let me just comment on that because I can't tell you the number of times I've sat in a deposition and the plaintiff's lawyer asks the vice president of operations, vice president of safety, the company director of safety, uh, do you receive reports of other accidents? Um, what do you do with them? Who reads them? Uh, is there any follow-up? Is there any closure? Uh, so that's something definitely to keep in mind in terms of do you have a process in place? Not just a function of are you on a mailing list, but do you have a process in place? And then more importantly, do you in fact bring closure to that process? Is there some uh, vehicle by which you in fact learn from the information you get? Uh, and one other comment about the human toll that Matt was talking about. Um, I, I can't tell you how many families I've interacted with over my career, uh, but one of the aspects in terms of your emergency response planning uh, that you really ought to make sure that you have included is your uh, human resources uh, in the context of your employees or whomever within your company is going to be dealing with the human side of this, whether it's your passengers, your customers, or whatever. Um, too many companies, and, and this is true with a lot of airlines, not the bigger airlines, they simply contract that out to some third party that specializes in dealing with victims. Uh, but it's your brand, it's your name, it's your company, it's your employees, and contracting it out may be required to go to a third party to contract out this part of it. Uh, but it's still critical that this part of it be part of your emergency response training, uh, because this is sort of the pointy end of the spear. I will tell you 
that family members that get angry during an investigation at your company will never get over the anger. And the anger just builds and builds and builds. And ultimately, I have seen it spill out in a courtroom. So it's something to keep in mind in terms of the way this thing may unfold over the years after the accident occurs. And I wanted to add, too, that um, remember, we've lost lives. Remember our, our mission? Our mission is we want to prevent it from happening again. Mark's mission is different. He wants to make sure that you're not going to lose a bunch of money. So when it comes down to people being truthful, talking to us, I want to make sure the, ha the accident doesn't happen again. I'm not in it for the money, and so that's where we are different. He's going to come at it and say, hey, no, we want to review what that person said to make sure they don't admit they made a mistake. So think about that, too, when you go through this. I mean, there are tragic times. Every single one of them is tragic. But what's the bottom line? Are you going to try to prevent it from happening again? Or are you going to try not to make out a big payoff? And so understand, again, we're coming from different sides of the fence, what we're after, what our goal is. Great uh, segue to a question. I'm Dave Blair with the uh, Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation as Chief Pilot for Safety and also an HAI Safety Committee member. Um, is there something akin to the military concept of privilege that's available to the NTSB or FAA investigations that would allow a party to participate um, without the specter of litigation looming over your head? Somebody who wants to genuinely improve the safety record may say, hey, you know, we made mistakes, but you know, can't necessarily be fully open because of the, you know, the specter of litigation. Yeah, and John, I don't know if, uh, if, if you're more up on this or not, but we've had that recently um, where we've had people that want to come forward and talk about what they know in accidents. And I believe that we do have some, uh, something that just recently Dana, I know I had worked on. Are you very familiar with that? Well, the truth is we are a transparent agency. We're the eyes and ears of, of the public. And our mandate is to share with the public all the information that the board considers in making findings or recommendations. Um, so folks in the industry would love for us to be able to extend some sort of privilege. Um, the only time that we can do that, I think this is where you were going, Tim, would be in, if it's proactive. Once there's an accident and we're investigating it, it's going to be transparent. But if you want to share some things that are voluntary to us, we would welcome that, and we can certainly privilege that information. If you're not involved in the accident, but you have some information about a similar event or a risk that you mitigated in a certain way that you think would be helpful for us to know, that would be voluntarily submitted data that we could protect. L let me just also make an observation. The answer is no, there's no privilege. Um, that's sort of, uh, except in the instance John said, I had a client where they took proactive steps and they took advantage okay. of the provision under the regulations, under the NTSB regulations to which John is alluding, uh, to disclose all of this to the NTSB, that they've done all these things and the purpose of doing that was one, to let the NTSB know that they were proactive and two, it really made it unnecessary for the NTSB to either examine future actions that the company should take, and it really did benefit the company in the context of the report. But, you know, when I sit there and I brief, let's assume you have a surviving pilot, and I brief the surviving pilot before he's interviewed by the NTSB. Our advice always, first and foremost, is you tell the truth. You tell the truth. Don't worry about the effect of that. That's why I'm here. You just tell the truth. You know, our goal there is, you know, can you imagine a pilot survives an accident? Let's assume some people die in it. He, they want to interview him. He's not so severely injured that he can't be interviewed right away. You stick him in that thing alone or without advice or without guidance, you know, it's not fair. And I don't think any of you would want to be in that situation because you're either dealing, or you may have the investigator in charge or the group chairman from the NTSB, you'll have a party representative from the manufacturer, you'll have a party representative from the engine manufacturer, you'll have a party from the FAA, you'll have your own company 
coordinator in there, and all of a sudden this person who's already feeling guilty, who's already in the midst of this storm, is being peppered with questions. Well, that's fine so long as they're prepared and so long as they have somebody there that they can turn to if they have a question. So it, it's, not, it's not a function and nobody should ever come away from this session or any, any belief at all that you know, companies should not come clean. But it's a function of people being prepared to know what's going on when they go into those sorts of situations. So when uh, Jeff talked about it as well, uh, and Mark did, is, so you have someone being interviewed. They're allowed to have one person with them. So that may be grandma, uh, it may be an attorney, but if the attorney's in there, they can't speak for that client, okay? So they can, and we always, every time we go into an interview, say the FA is sitting here, but if you would like them to leave the room, we'll certainly do that. And so, um, so they're allowed one person, doesn't matter who that person is, uh, maybe a union representative, maybe an attorney, maybe grandma, like By I said. By the way, one of the things I always do when we meet the employee for the first time, and, and I explain to them exactly what Tim just said, that you're entitled to have one representative, and the NTSB doesn't care whether it's your mother, your father, your grandmother, they don't care who it is. Would you rather have your grandmother instead of me? So, because they're gonna ask, that's one of the questions that the investigator is going to ask right at the beginning. They're going to say, Mr. Smith, uh, you're accompanied here today by Mark Dombroff. Is he representing you? And so you want to make sure that that person has been prepared to know why that question is being asked, because this is a very, very difficult situation for somebody who very likely may feel responsible for the death or injury associated with other people. All right, we have time for two more questions. Hi, Ryan, uh, Director of Safety for a small part, 135 and 91 operator out of Central Oregon. Um, there was a question earlier about students and resources for lessons to be learned and that kind of thing. And um, with the, I've been in aviation almost 20 years. With the advent of safety management systems coming in to helicopter operations, um, and the current state of evolution of where we're at with those safety management systems, I view that as a, a big tool that I think has been overlooked in this discussion. Um, but it's an amazing resource, and I don't think there's any better way for companies to learn lessons learned than from their own people or other companies that do similar operations. Um, that's my first point. My, my second point is a question about um, the information in those reports, which can be fairly detailed, how admissible is that stuff in the court of law at this point since uh, those, those systems aren't even required at this point and they're sort of self-disclosure within a company, can those be forced to be extracted and, and examined in the case of an accident? Uh, well, we're talking about the group chairman reports generally, the factual reports, as opposed to the final report. If it's the final report, there's a pretty strong argument that none of it's admissible. But I think you're absolutely right. When you get into a group chairman's report, the factual group chairman's report, and it's called group chairman's factual report, um, as a general rule, we operate under the premise that 100% of it's going to be admissible, which is why it is critical, as Tim said, that your party representative to the investigation understand that if there's something they don't agree with that's in that report, they note their disagreement on the report before they sign it. Because if they don't, they will be found to have adopted that report and anything that's in it in the context of the litigation. Now, part, the real problem comes when you do have analysis in the context of a group chairman's report. And where does it go from pure analysis into fact gathering? And so even from our perspective in the context of the litigation, we don't necessarily accept the fact that everything in the group chairman's report is factual. We actually start to look at it sentence by sentence and we will try to, in the context of the litigation, parse out anything that may be found to be analysis, opinions and so forth because it's supposed to be factual. That process actually, <clears throat> excuse me, 
ought to start during the investigation when your representative says, well, look, this is an analysis and it doesn't belong in the group chairman's report. And that discussion should be had as part of this review of the group notes before they're finalized and before they're ever signed. And I, let me just piggyback. Uh, so SMS, uh, you're right, it's going to kick in. A lot of companies have it already where they're not, they've got, they have to have a program where they're collecting complaints and they're talking about their corrective actions outside of an accident. But then an accident happens and it's like NTSB and FAA say, we want to see your ASAP, we want to see your confidential pilot reports, we want to see, I think there are some protections. Well, we fight on, on the ASAP reports, we fight on any voluntary disclosure program that you may have internally to prevent it from getting turned over in litigation with varying success. Um, if you, some of you may remember the Comair accident in Kentucky. I was just going to say. Yeah, that was sort of a watershed loss for the industry in the sense that the judge ordered that ASAP reports be turned over. What could have a more chilling effect than, uh, on a program than spreading those out in litigation? The military, on the other hand, separates the investigation between the safety board investigation and the JAG investigation. And the Supreme Court has addressed the issue of the privilege and the protection of the safety board investigation. Thank you. I want to thank you all for showing up in a great uh, presentation. My name's Bill DeRemer. I'm the uh, director of safety for Helicopters, Inc. And I, I, I need a clarification. I, I've been a party to an investigation in my capacity. And um, my question is on the attorney uh, part of the investigation, does that not jeopardize your party status? Because everything that I was understanding, once we're a part of this uh, investigation, we can't share any of that information with anybody outside of our party status. So I, I need a little bit of a clarification on what I've heard earlier today. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair question. When I started doing this, actually, um, the FAA party uh, spokesperson for accident hearings was actually one of the lawyers out of the general counsel's office and that got changed over the years. Um, when we get involved in the context of an investigation, we're not there in the context of liability or claims. We're there to help the company understand the aspects of the investigation. We're there to work typically behind the scenes with the NTSB. On big investigations, the NTSB these days, um, starting a few years ago, actually started to send somebody from their general counsel's office. And I think has recognized that uh, law dealing lawyer to lawyer sort of behind the scenes can help facilitate things like uh, handling wreckage, uh, salvage, uh, payments to family members. Um, it can facilitate a lot that may not be quite as simple in the context of the investigation that's, that's actually taking place. So I, again, I think it's a function of we're not there to be part of the investigation. We're there to make sure that you as an operator and participant in the investigation understand what's going on as it unfolds and make sure that not only do you, do you take advantage of, of what's available to you, but you don't step over the line in areas where you shouldn't be. You know, media statements are a great example. One of the things I always tell my clients is, we'd like to see anything you issue to the media before you issue it. Otherwise, you're gonna end up like, I won't name the airline, XYZ airline thrown out of their own investigation. Um, social media posts, another area that we like to look at it to make sure you're not stepping over lines. So, yeah, there is a tension, but I think it's one that's really incumbent upon the lawyer to make sure the line's not stepped over. So I'll uh, piggyback on that in that uh, it'd be a good idea to let the NTSB see that before you do a release, too. Um, that happens once in a while where you may talk to your attorney and he right. says, fine, and you release it, but it's a big surprise to the NTSB, mm -hmm. and you might find yourself outside the investigation. So to be safe, uh, let... Uh, the NTSB review that. Uh, let me well. add to that. If, if you've shown that press release to your attorney and they said it's fine and you release it and as a result the NTSB kicks you off the investigation, fire your lawyer. <laughs> um, that, that, that would be my legal advice to all of you. Why, the first thing I ever do when I get retained, literally the first thing I ever do, the first thing I did, I think it was a Friday night about 11 o'clock when I got retained on the spaceship accident, 
is I called the general counsel's office of the NTSB, and I said, I've been retained on connection with the spaceship accident to help them through the investigation, and I'm headed out to Mojave. And, and so that, that immediately trickles through to John and then from John down. And I, I like to believe that Tim and John and the staff, uh, the Office of Aviation Safety, uh, are comfortable that, you know, at least we understand where the lines are and where not to step over them. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate your involvement today. I think uh, you've shed a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you to the audience for joining us and for uh, Clint Johnson help putting this together. Enjoy the show. <laughs>